Hi, my name is Jan. I'm part of the Exec team together with Tom. And today I would like to show you how to set up your controls and the preferences for the Exec 737. And um, the first thing that we'll start out with is jumping to the cockpit and then I'm going to start the um, menu here for setting up your joystick. And um, the, the first thing that we're going to go over is setting up the response curves. Now, if you click on control sensitivity, you can move the slider, but I have found out that uh, for the 737, uh, it does not really work. For example, you could put this pitch one to maximum fine grain control center, uh, control near control center and click on done, done. And then if you jump to the back and you see me move the joystick up and down, you see that you know, the elevator is moving pretty much linearly with uh, me deflecting the joystick. It doesn't like start moving really slow near the center. Now, the, the way to change that would go, would be going to um, set up a response curve. And if you take the response curve and make it like this, you will see that it's very flat near the center and then goes up steep later on. And if you would do that, then go back and you can see now as I move it, it my, I'm deflecting my joystick pretty much halfway here. You see it doesn't start moving much until I deflect it almost all the way and then it suddenly flips all the way to the maximum deflection. So setting up a control response curve does work, but um, I would personally advise against that. Um, if you have a fairly good joystick, you can still control the plane pretty good with just deflecting the yoke just a little bit and of course that's the same way for the aileron control now some other things that i have set up on my joystick that i would recommend you doing is uh, setting the um, flaps down a notch flaps up a notch buttons and then maybe speed brakes extend one speed brakes retract one and i've also set up trim of course on the head switch pitch trim down, electric trim rocker switch, pitch trim up, electric trim rocker switch, then you have roll trim left, roll trim right, and I also have set up yaw trim left and yaw trim right, and that way you have all the trim commands up, uh, set up on your joystick. And one button, very important to me, is the button one, go to save 3D cockpit location number one. And if you uh, move your view around like this, and with the buttons and you can go back and forth up and down and tilt it and then you use the control numpad keys for example i'm going to use control numpad uh, seven to save this view now whenever i hit the seven key i'm going to jump back straight to that view and that's the way i have set up my con my save view number one and if i click a joystick button no matter where i look if i click the joystick button i'm straight back at my default view. Now the W uh, key is also a default view, but you can see that it's impossible to see um, the EHSI down here. And even if you tilt your view back, you can see that the yoke is in the way and the a real pilot position would be up a little further. So you can just you know glance over the uh, dash and then you see when you move up, you can almost see the whole EHSI. And if you move in a little closer, this is what the real pilot view would be. But then, of course, you don't have some of the FMC uh, things. So I have set my view up like this. And you can see the yoke is still a little bit in the way of the EHSI. Of course, you can lower the yoke if you want to, or even click on it down here on the base to make it disappear completely. And uh, I'll show you how to do that in a second. But this is uh, the view I have set up on my joystick button. So whenever I'm lost i can just click that button and i'm i'm right back there i also have the uh, zoom in fast and zoom out fast if you want to look at something real close by just using the joystick that's those are good ones and of course i have set up the disengage autopilot on on this button that's also an, an important one if you engage the autopilot and then you just click the button and it starts the whaler and you have to click it a second time to silence the warning and uh, that is a, a button you would want instinctively to always be at your disposal if the autopilot acts up you can just disconnect it and uh, then i have also set up my um, my 
uh, Warthog Throttle and uh, this comes with a nice preview and of course it has the comfort of having Throttle 1 and Throttle 2 and I have also another lever up here for reverse if you have that one it's uh, very nice but then you can just use this little lever here on the side that you can see down here uh, to toggle reverse and I have also set up and this is something that a lot of people ask about um, this button up here on the front you, I can click it and it's the uh, button number four it's the autopilot takeoff go around that's the default explain command you can see it here autopilot takeoff go around and um, oops now I'm back and this is what you want to use to actually trigger the toga command you can also of course um, use these buttons up here that's what the real pilots use it says auto take off and go around you click on those and um, but of course you'd have to use the mouse to do it and it's much more convenient if you have them on your hardware uh, thrust levers or throttles as you would in the real airplane now some other stuff that I have set up is um, I'm just going to click apply here I have uh, set up the um, actually on, on my throttle there's not much more you can go did I set up this one here no there's a yeah there's the a reboot gizmo uh, that I have set up uh, but that's more for developing and um, I haven't set up all these myriad of other switches here I use the mouse in the in the um, virtual cockpit to manipulate most of my commands and um, then of course I have rudder pedals but there's no buttons or anything to set up there they're just set up to yaw now let's uh, go with uh, the preferences menu and uh, since we talked about the yoke you invoke the preferences menu by bumping the mouse to the left side of the screen and um, there's a preference to disable this and then if you have triggered that by accident and you want to get to it you can also go to plugins you go to gizmo 64 windows you go down here to the XX737 Classic, you click on it, and then you have this menu as well. And we start up here with the preferences, and let's start with the visuals up here. Camera shaking is, of course, an effect that you get when rolling down the runway, when using the speed brakes, or when uh, extending flaps to 40. Uh, then the plane in real life will shake a little bit. I flew it for 10 years, and you can immediately tell if the flaps are at 40 because there's a, there's a little buffeting that goes on and we try to recreate that with camera shaking. And of course, you have the winglets. Um, the 737 Classic does come with the option to have winglets. We do not model a reduced uh, uh, you know, fuel consumption, and the you know, actual savings are really small. They're just a percent or so, and um, that's why we don't model that. Then we have the steam gauge engine instruments. That's the option that I have now, and if you uncheck that, you see it changes in real time. Um, the, the save button does come up whenever you change something, but uh, you don't really have to click it for some stuff. It never hurts to do so because uh, some other options um, require you to save. So I make it a habit of always clicking the save button. We may change it in the future so that it only lights up for things that you actually need to click save. But uh, for now, it always lights up. So this would be the, the default option. And then of course you have the eyebrow windows and um, those were up here. When I started flying the 737, we had these. Uh, of course, this was uh, from the um, legacy construction of the 737 when you would still fly in the pattern a lot and you would you know, need to see the runway when you were banking uh, hard towards it or uh, you know, look out for enemy fighters. But um, later on, they plucked up these windows because uh, they would cost a lot of maintenance and they found out that it's not really necessary to have them so that that's why we have this option over here on advanced you have weight in kilograms and tons and one way to really ascertain what you have set is by zooming down here to the fuel and if you click on this one you see that the little label down here changes to lbs to pounds and if you click on it it changes to kilograms do not confuse that with uh, um, weight and balance menu that you get with X-Plane where you can also switch between US customary and metric. This does not do anything for the fuel weights that you put into the FMS. We had some support uh, questions about that. Um, 
and people do get to tend confused because the FMC will limit the weights that you can put in and if you have set this one to kilograms and then you want to say okay I um, 100,000 pounds and you try to put that in you get the invalid entry because that of course would be 100 tons and that would be just a little too heavy for this uh, cute little 737. Now the next thing is the disable mini EHSI window. Uh, what happens is when you look down here to the EHSI control panel down here and you change something, you get a little pop-up down here because often when, you, when you're focused down here, you cannot look at this uh, EHSI at the same time. And um, if you make choices here, then it's, it's better to, you know, you can really spot what you're doing down here on the bottom left. And if you don't like that for realism, reality reasons or realism reasons, you can disable that and you will see then if you change something, you know, nothing pops up. It only changes up here on the real HSI, so to say. Um, this is what I was talking about. Um, the disable main menu pop out. If I click that, then I can bump here and this will not pop out anymore. You'd have to invoke it by going over through the d uh, plugins up here. Now, ghost throttles, that's another concept that causes a lot of confusion. I'll try to explain it real quick. What happens is if you set up a speed for the plane to fly and you engage the auto throttle and you say, okay, fly this speed. Now the plane will add thrust to get to that speed. Of course, it can take off warning is blaring because I don't have any flip set. Now, if I using my joystick, you can see that here on the, on the right side, my hardware, I'm trying to move, but I cannot control the throttles because the auto throttle is doing that now. And uh, the way to regain throttle control would be to say, okay, stop using the throttles. And now, if you see me move my thrust levers down here, you can see as soon as I move these ghost throttles down here on the right side, as soon as I move them towards my real or the physical throttles in the cockpit, they will grab them. And now I can control them again. That's the way that we switch between auto throttle control and user control. And if you don't like this little pop-up, you can say disable that. See, I'm going to go to speed mode again. I say, no, I don't want that. And now if I move my thrust levers immediately, they grab this, uh, you know, the virtual thrust levers and I can control that with my throttle again. That's what this ghost throttle thing is all about. Now we have two more options here for the controlling the throttles because a lot of folks only have one um, you know access available for throttle I have the luxury I have this this cool warthog thing where I can move them separately but some people don't have that and that's not a problem because usually they work you know in unison but what happens if you have an engine failure the the you know the normal thing to do in an engine failure is you have to retard one of them you use the mouse to do that and then you can still use the other one. Now, if you have a dual setup like I do, then you would click this one, the single engine ops. And that means that every engine is controlled by its own uh, thrust lever, really. And, um, oops, let me do that. So, okay, I'm going to click single engine ops. Now, if I pull one back and then move my hardware again, you see that both start moving again. And that's what you would do if you have an engine failure, you would retard your hardware and then fly like this. But if you don't have that, then you would go like this. And then if you retard one and then move the throttle, it will stay where it is until you actually move the other one to the idle position as well. And then they move again. But that way you can fly correctly by retarding one lever and then using the hardware uh, throttle just like you would normally flying with just a single engine and then there's another option this is for the VR guys and if you click that one then you can use the mouse to grab both in the center and move them together and if you just grab one on the edge then it will move all by itself and this is a little click spot that we added here in the center so that you people that fly with VR wands or VR controllers can grab the throttle and don't have to you know grab grab the left one and push it up and then grab the right one push it up and juggle it like this you can just grab them in the middle and move them together 
Now the pause sim at top of descent. That's, uh, you know, self-explanatory. When you get to the top of descent as entered into the FMS, the plane will pause. And then if you were downstairs watching a show while you're flying for five hours somewhere, then uh, there's no risk of you missing the top of descent. Um, open doors and turnaround mode, it's another uh, obvious one. If you use the turnaround uh, spot state, then the doors will be open and you'll have to close them before you start flying. And of course, the IRU fast alignment uh, also explains with the mouse pop over. Normally, when you align the IRSs up here, it takes a long time for them to align and you can shorten that uh, and uh, get it down to one minute. Now, the Avitab is another interesting thing. This is, uh, I have that selected, of course, I really like this. And what, what it does, it, it adds, you know, the, the hardware, so to say. You still need to download and uh, install the Avitab plugin. It's a free plugin and uh, it really adds this cool little functionality. Now, one limitation is you will always see the same stuff on both sides. If I, uh, you know, start the, um, start the map on this side, you will look over here and you also see the map. Now, you can use the mouse wheel to scroll in and scroll out if you have the mouse pointer within the Avitab area. And up here, this is a little hard to see. I'm going to move in a little bit. See, here is the little power button. And that's what a lot of people miss. And um, it doesn't, it's not animated, but um, it turns the Avitab on and off. And that's, uh, you know, a lot of people wonder how to turn it on. Now, there's one thing that we included you can of course, you know, buy a subscription at Navigraph and, and you get the, you know, all the, all the maps and everything. But of course, you can add your own stuff as well. You can, for example, if you go to the um, aircraft folder here, you see this is this is just my Windows uh, file path, so to say. And it's, this is my x 12 test bed installation, aircraft, X-Aviation, XX737 Classics, and there's a subfolder called Manuals. And in the Manuals, I have added three PDF files, and you can just add whatever PDF file you want in there as well. And um, you know that we sometimes have a little problem with our VNAV descent planning. And to help with that, I put in this little file, and you can zoom in, and you can see there's a descent table and rule of thumb uh, table that will help you plan your descent. You got the rule of thumb here, you got the descent profile, and then I have some exact values. So if you say, hey, I'm at 24,000 feet, then you know I need 74.6 nautical miles to get to the ground. And then you can always use this table to check your descent and plan it um, a little better than uh, you would just by going uh, distance uh, times three or you can look at the flap speed schedule, um, the placard speeds, whoops, the placard speeds for the plane are down here, of course, but these are the limit speeds. If you have flaps one, you can fly up to 230 knots and without, you know, breaking them. But how slow can you fly? Well, this is something that 737 pilots need to memorize. And you can see the minimum maneuvering speed here for flaps one would be 190 unless you are um, above 53 tons or 116,000 uh, pounds, then you would need to fly 210 more. And um, this is also up here when you need to select your next flap. So you can look at this one and it will give you some guideline how slow you can fly after you select flaps five, flaps 10, and so on. And uh, last but not least, we have the required landing distance down in here. And this will tell you if you are 50 tons, uh, if you have a gross weight of 50 tons, then you need 1,355 meters um, as required landing distance. And um, you can check that out here. And you can basically add whatever PDF you want here. You can add your, you know, download approach charts or whatever you want. Put them into the manuals folder and, or any other folder. You can, you can navigate uh, these up here, up and down like this, see? And oh, it doesn't work right here. Up one direction, here you go. So, and then you can see now you're in the, in the main folder and you can scroll down here. So you could add another folder, maybe instead of manuals, you can name it maps or charts or whatever, and then display whatever PDF you want uh, in the Navi, uh, in the Avitab. So this is 
a really, really cool feature. Now, um, down here is miscellaneous and you have the mini EHSI size. Of course, that's how big this little thing is that pops out here. You got the joystick CVS dead zone. That's control wheel steering. If you are um, just engaging the autopilot without any commands, you can see that it engages in command, but it's got control wheel steering pitch and roll. And if you um, move your joystick and you will find out that if you just move it a tiny bit, then nothing happens. But if you uh, move it more, then the pitch or the roll of the plane would change. And this is basically the dead zone that you check. Sometimes people use the autopilot and they find out that it disconnects frequently because the, you know, the plane thinks that the user is making inputs, especially if you have a little jittery joystick that goes like this, then you can increase that dead zone and that should stop the autopilot disconnecting. Master sound is just that, master sound. And be advised that when you change sounds here, you also change the sounds in the, you know, in the uh, explain default sounds, and this will stick. So if you uh, like, you know, put down the airflow volume, make the airflow go a little more quiet, then this will also change the, um, I think the aircraft interior, exterior, or one of these sounds. So when you're done playing with the 737 and you want to fly another plane again, whoops, now the autopilot is trying to trim, disconnect it, um, then um, you want to make sure that your sounds are set up correctly again. And of course, the last thing is the yoke hike. If you find it that it's in the way all the time, then you can slide it down, see, and that way you can look over the yoke a little better and see what's going on on the map. That's a little gameplay concession. The real yoke is in the way when you sit like this and the pilot can easily move his head to, to glance over or look around or so. And um, But since you can't do that so easily unless you fly in VR, we added this option to adjust the yoke height down here as well. Now, start state again, um, where you, you can choose the cold and dark, the turnaround. If I click on apply settings, should have done that in the, you know, start out with because um, it's not so loud. The engines aren't running, and of course you have the APU running and it's powering the aircraft. So this is what the plane would be like when you are in between two legs in the turnaround, and uh, you see the cockpit doors open, and um, you can, you know, see the passengers, or you can't see the passengers, but you could see them board or. Um, your catering going on and go get a coffee or stuff like that. Now, um, then we have uh, the ground services. You can invoke this menu by, by bumping down here, or you could, for a little more realism, do the ground call. It's, if you click that button, there's the wobble downstairs uh, on the loudspeaker, and that should alert uh, the ground crew. In real life, everyone ignores that. Um, but uh, we added it nonetheless. And you can say connect the ground power unit and you can see up here the ground power becomes available, disconnected. You can see connect ground air supply and um, right now I have the APU going, but if I switch the APU off, you can see the duct pressure fall. And if you want to start the engines without APU, uh, you know, maybe it's in op or whatever, then you can say connect ground air supply and that puts a little air cart out there that um, pushes air into the engine and i think we still yeah we still have that one here you can see that's what it would look like uh, that's what we call an air starter and of course you have the option to open the cargo doors and if you do that the front and uh, aft cargo door go open and uh, they can load and unload the aircraft now the cabin crew is the same thing. You can uh, call the cabin crew attendance and that invokes the cabin crew panel or you can just bump out and, and click on it. And of course we have open the doors. Uh, you can turn on and off the front galley lights, rear galley lights, emergency exit lights and so on. Of course you can also uh, move back here, go to the flight attendant panel one left and then you can uh, turn the lights and uh, switch them here and, and uh, set all the lighting in the, um, in the 
cabin and also do the emergency exit lights, uh, light them up. And that's what they like to do in the mornings when they check functionality and they turn on the exit lights and they say, oh, please check the emergency exit lights. And then all the flight attendants are walking around and making sure that they all work as they should. Um, failures is the last thing that uh, we implemented and that was pretty much more for testing the plane. Um, mm, we have some failures that work through the, uh, the default uh, failure system here. You can fail an engine, for example, uh, in X-Plane and it will work, of course. Um, but uh, some things we coded around and uh, for example, let's say I want to fail um, cause a hydraulic leak. You can see there's the hydraulic quantity down here. And if I fail um, system A leak, and I'll say go really quick, and you can see the quantity starts to drop. And then you will eventually see all the users that use a, a hydraulic uh, run dry, and you cannot you know, raise the gear anymore and stuff like that. And you'd have to uh, use the you know, emergency gear handles to pull them out and, and uh, drop the gear. So this is something cool to play with if you want to go the next step and you're bored of flying just from A to B and nothing really happens ever, then you can use these things to uh, invoke um, problems. But um, you can also, you know, fail buses or you can discharge the battery and stuff like that. Um, it all works. It's all, you know, hooked up correctly. You'll get the, the correct uh, lights going on here. If you fail a transfer bus one, that's a biggie. That's what all the important stuff is on. You can see that and um, it takes a while for the things to uh, power up again here, the EADI and EHSI. Um, but yeah, this is uh, if you if you really want to check uh, how we wired up everything or so, this is uh, nice to play around with. OK, now the last thing I want to show you before I conclude this little overview is the um, checklist. It's up here and you can flip it in and out by clicking on this little slot up here. This is where the real checklist uh, is. It's laminated and you slide it in there. And uh, we have this little one. And if you click in the middle, you can switch it around. And again, it says some of the minimum maneuvering uh, speeds for the flaps, for example, the limits, um, and shows you some, some checklists on there as well that you can use to operate the plane. And of course, you also have, um, you can see, we have a before taxi checklist on here. Now the stick checklists that we have here are still from an older time when uh, the before taxi checklist was called taxi checklist. So you have uh, that one on here and you can use the slider. Of course, that's what we would do if we read the checklist and then leave it down here. And then later on when you uh, think, hey, did we even read the taxi checklist? You can see I are the sliders down here. We must have done that. Okay, um, this is pretty much the overview uh, of how to set up your 737. And um, of course, there's variations. You can you know, set up more buttons. We have a million commands that you can set for everything, you know, operating the autopilot and uh, lights and stuff. But um, I use my mouse mostly to um, do stuff here in the cockpit because um, it's like mimicking the motion that I used to do when I flew it. I would look up here and uh, turn on the pedostatics. I wouldn't uh, mash a button on my joystick, but some buttons I have set up, for example, as I talked about the autopilot disengage, it is here on the stick and you can use the mouse to do it. But um, it is more natural when you fly the plane with your joystick uh, to actually use the joystick to do that. And um, of course, disconnecting the autopilot. A lot of people will use the disengage bar. I'm just gonna get this off my chest right here. This is never used in the real airplane. Um, it does say disengage, but what it does, it, it disconnects power from the flight control computers. And you don't want that because you often use the flight director still. Uh, so this is like an emergency switch. If you really want to disconnect it, you will mostly use the autopilot disengage button, or you can click this button here. It will also disconnect. And then you can click the blinking light down here to uh, silence the warning and uh, disconnect the autopilot that way. Okay, um, I think that's it. And I'm gonna do some flights that are a little less uh, theoretical next, but uh, for now, this should 
get you started using the 737.